As I'm sure everyone knows by now, the Department of Supply Chain Management at the University of Arkansas is the number one ranked undergraduate program in North America, according to Gartner. Well, the Gartner Industry Survey, the survey that collects responses and data every two years on the supply chain programs, is now live, and we want you to help us keep it that way. Follow the instructions in the description of this episode or go directly to supplychain.uark.edu to get access to the Gartner Industry Survey. The survey will consist of two questions and is open till Monday, February the 12th. Responses from private email accounts won't count, so please use the work emails when filling it out. We appreciate your participation and hopefully when the results are announced in May, the University of Arkansas will retain the number one spot for the third consecutive voting cycle. All right. Good morning and welcome to Conversations on Retail. My name is Matt Pfeiffer and we are so excited to continue Mike Grain's series focused on on shelf availability. It is a soggy day in Northwest Arkansas and uh, we're back from a a bit of an extended break from the the holidays, and I know Mike uh, has been traveling and, and hitting conferences and so forth, but we're super excited to be back. Mike's guest today is our friend Myron Burke. He's the founder and CEO of Divergent Technology Advisors, based here in Northwest Arkansas, and the two of them are going to be talking today about the impact of serialized items on retail supply chains. Well, Myron and I have known each other a long, long time. I'm going to let him introduce himself here in a minute, but uh, we, we go back to the early days when Myra and I was at Procter and Gamble and you were at Walmart. And uh, I think it was around the 2002, 2003, you said, yeah, we're thinking about doing this technology that allows us to track pallets and cases through the supply chain. And you and I had a chance to to work back then. And, and then I got a chance to work with you for many years, uh, which I absolutely enjoyed. Uh, most of it, some of it, it was challenging, <laughs> but that's okay. It, it made me grow for sure in right. a good way, in a good way. Um, we can get into some of those stories later, but Myron, go ahead and introduce yourself to to our guests. Yeah, good morning. It's great to be with you, Mike, and 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 lots of memories there. So uh, briefly, um, been in Northwest Arkansas since 1999. Uh, here with my wife and kids, um, and spent 26 years with Walmart. Uh, an amazing career uh, where I was able to really create my own path through the mentoring of, of many great leaders. Uh, started in clubs, uh, came into finance and tax compliance, and became a problem solver in those areas of sort of automating redundant work that people don't really want to do for a very long period of time, uh, and, and built a career out of that, uh, working through the first innovation team. The International Science was three years in Japan, uh, business process and engineering team. We built that from the ground up. We're here to talk a little bit about the whole idea of serialized data and serialized uh, supply chain. Uh, and Myron has been a, a huge advocate of this, and it, just his background of this for years and years. I think we've we've celebrated the fact that the UPC is now officially 50 years old. And, and while, while we recognize that, it has been a huge help for things like looking up, you know, eliminating having to price every in, individual item and doing inventory and all the stuff. I mean, you can't imagine life without a UPC today. It's been an integral part of what we've had to do. Uh, but there is some limitations to the UPC. Um, and one of the uh, limitations is for years, we've looked at the UPC of an item and the quantity that we have. So I've got a strawberry pop tarts. This is the UPC and I've got 20 of them, uh, which has been great. But unfortunately we are moving to a platform that we need to have individual understanding of not just the fact that we have a UPC in quantity, but we also want to have some attributes about each one of those individual selling units. And so we talked a lot about RFID and 2D barcodes. We're not going to spend much time talking about those as concepts because those are the way you capture the data, either through scanning it uh, or potentially an RFID one. What we want to spend a little bit of time talking about is the idea of we're moving to a serialization. And I, I think some people already know this. They've heard of this before. But what does that mean, really? Well, what that means is a couple things. Number one, we still have the basic UPC, which is what is the selling unit. But for each one of the selling units, we're going to have a unique serial number tied to that UPC. Example, uh, I've got 20, I've got 50 uh, strawberry Pop-Tarts. The UPC will be the same, but I will have a unique serial number on each one of those. So I can really identify all 50 are different items, but they all roll up to the same UPC. 
And we'll show you some of the some of the benefits of that here in a little bit. But I think that's really important. So when you think about that, all the systems, the legacy systems between suppliers and retailers now have this unique thing, which is the unique serial number, which is tied to every one of the items. So how do we take advantage of that is, is really the kind of the question. So, um, and Myron, anytime you come back, stop me. But um, w- what we've got here is we've got two ways that we can do this. One is we can leverage RFID data capture as a way of capturing that unique serial number. And the other one is as as part of uh, the the GS1 standards uh, for Sunrise 2027, we'll be able to capture that same thing with an actual 2D barcode. What's been the value proposition from your perspective of the UPC? And what do you say is that differentiating value proposition for uh, serialized data? I think that'd be helpful to get your perspective. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's, I was thinking about this the other day um, that with my parents and <clears throat> um, they've both passed away, but, you know, with the barcode being 50 years old, my, my parents passed away at the age of 80. Is They spent 30 years of their life without a barcode even as a thought in, mm-hmm. in commerce. And then I sort of grew up when the Garvey gun of sticking price stickers on every single can of soup and every can of soda and things in a grocery store was, was on its way out. And then we moved into to this barcode scanning aspect at, at point of sale. And I look back, you know, over, over my generation and think about my parents. And I'm like, if you look at how fast we move product and the level of automation we have uh, through structured symbologies, whether that be the numbers that make up the barcode, the, the, the company prefix and the item reference, those numbers at the bottom that get translated into a symbology um, whether that's a, a linear barcode, what could be a QR code, or even things in an RF structure today uh, without line of sight, w- we've changed the, the amount of data that we can flow and the rate at which we can flow data and enabled machine-to-machine communication on things that used to be human-to-asset, asset-to-human communication in every instance. Um, you know, making a product, boxing a product, shipping a product, unloading a product, stocking a product, checking out a product was all human to product relationships. And today, almost all of those are machine to machine automated. And I think the barcode has has enabled the speed of commerce that we have around the world, not just regionally, in a way that I think we've never fathomed before. And I think today with Sunrise 2027, serialized barcodes, um, and I think this is where it's, it's tough for some folks to get their head around it. We are now actually approaching a generational shift in data and automation capabilities um, that I believe for, you know, 20 years or 30 years of the barcode, we didn't believe was even fathomable. Um, and and I, I equate it to uh, sort of the checkbook in an aspect of, you know, when you, when you put serialization into it, it's like, oh, I have a check. I have a name on it. I have an account number, well, but I also have a check number. And that check number, could you imagine writing checks without a check number? I mean, I grew up, my parents had blue and red checks that were counter checks and they used to use those. It was a pain to track. Now you have check numbers. Can you imagine writing a check without check numbers? Um, and then imagine not, imagine using, using a credit card without a security number. And so I think the serial number for product becomes that, tertiary check and balance that allows us to add an unlimited number of attributes, an unlimited number of state and status indicators as to the life cycle of that product, um, the warranty serviceability of that, the authenticity of that, and and a lot of things that we'll talk about today, um, that if you haven't spent time in the space of thinking about it, it is way beyond inventory counting the value of what the serial number brings to the marketplace. So we, we've got actually a slide that I've borrowed from GS1. Several of these are, are GS1 slides, but I think this one's pretty good. It's a pretty broad slide, but let's, okay, so great. So serialized items are basically the UPC and a unique serial number to uh, to attract and, and be able to provide attributes for a single item rather than this UPC quantity. Here's a big bunch of broad kind of user cases, inventory management, traceability, et cetera. So, Okay, that's great. I, I have the ability to be able to now serialize items. What are some of the really practical in retail? What are some of the practical in the retail supply chain? What are some of the practical applications for that? 
Um, I think if you look at the retail supply chain, obviously inventory, inventory shrink, um, you know, that whole inventory management bucket is, is such a big deal and a big topic right now. I think it's a big topic because we're, we're running up against some of the gaps in general accounting principles between retail accounting versus cost accounting. Um, and if you think of that, compare Walmart and Target's releases around shrink to Sam's Club and Costco's, they're, they're quite contrasting as to what they're experiencing um, because it's, it, it becomes accountability to the item level. And, and what serialization gives us is that accountability to the item level. Beyond inventory, I now have this authenticity. I can authentic authenticate things with the manufacturer in, in doing that matching. I can do the traceability of where it went in the life cycle, how long it spent at that location, uh, where it may have stopped in the middle by tying a serial number to a pro number on a trailer and connecting the pro number to the GPS on a tractor. And so there's this internet of things that starts to connect this in here. And, and it's not about the case. It's about the actual item unit that a consumer will buy that goes in that case, or maybe didn't go in that case. Um, we've seen situations of where that can be uh, safety related to temperature management on insulin or in COVID. We saw a lot of things with temperature management on COVID drugs, um, uh, safe handling, G-force impacts uh, for potential breakage of things. Internal circuits could be damaged with certain G-force impacts if something was in an accident. Box looks okay, but the product's not. Things like that can be tra track and traced and warrantied uh, or recalled and you ensure you get all of those back. Um, the sustainability effort, I think, is probably the most misclassified one. There's a lot of things, and, and I, I don't want to dismiss it, but there's a lot of discussion about RFID tags or different types of uh, symbology indicators and say, well, are they sustainable or not? Um, but I think those processors give us the ability to actually track where does packaging go after it's used, and is that getting recycled? With the extended serial number, we can actually link that serial number to how should I handle this type of recyclable versus, you know, trying to train 300 million people in America to read what the recyclable codes mean and they do change. So they have to change with it. Automating that where I could just scan it and it gives me a disposition with my phone or I can have a scanner on a trash compactor and it gives me the disposition of, you know, recyclable, non-recyclable. And then tracking that, um, I think makes a bigger dent in the recyclable and recircular economy than we could ever make uh, just off of, you know, human trust alone, uh, because financials get in the way. I think corporately financials get in the way. And so being able to track that and trust that becomes very, very opportunistic, uh, both in the recycling of packaging, um, in the ownership of packaging. There's a lot of companies who make products for, uh, I talk about the oil industry a lot. The oil industry generates oil. Um, they buy most of their packaging. But if you buy a case of motor oil, Somebody else, maybe DuPont or somebody built the package. There's no tracker on the package, but there's a G10 for the oil. Well, who's responsible for the sustainability of that product or the recyclability of that product? It should be both companies, the creator and the, the uh, person putting product in it. Uh, it's a little bit like the DVD industry. When it was around, you were buying content on a disc. The disc was nothing but a, a media carrier. Uh, but the recyclability of those discs became a challenge. And, and we've moved through that by moving to digital media. But I think there's other products that follow that same work structure that serialization can really help move the needle on. Uh, but setting back and thinking this far ahead into the future when, you know, we're still at the early days of uh, sustainability and recycling and how to actually drive true packaging improvements um, and, and understand the P&L cost or impact to those things, um, I think serialization is what gives us that next level intelligence as to what happens with the, the, the billions and billions of water bottles. Where do they end up? How do they end up in, you know, a plastic island in the Indian Ocean? Where, where does that stuff come from? And, and some of it's trash that we export uh, because we'd rather deal with it somewhere else in our own country. And that's, that's an unfortunate reality. It's hard to quantify because we, we don't have that. But again, it gives you this visibility from the authentication at the manufacturer side all the way down to the packaging and the points of safety information. If there's a formulation change and that could create an allergy change, you can actually allow users to scan that and understand it 
versus reprinting all your packaging. You can actually send alert to known users in your user group uh, from your, your sales and management uh, CRM devices. Uh, so there's lots of interconnectedness that this serial number opens up across all business and commerce channels. Hmm. Wow, that's a lot. That's a, that's a lot of different <laughs> opportunity for sure. Um, I, I thought I put together a couple of examples that might be really helpful that that people could relate to. And, and uh, uh, it's interesting, uh, Myron, because Matt Schill was on the on the, uh, one of the participants of this uh, thing, and he he and I kind of talked about this when he was still at Walmart, and you as well. So here's a kind of a, a really live example of what things could be done. You mentioned state and status. And that and that's really an interesting way of doing this. So what I got here is is basically the the number six, the current system thinks I have six specific television sets. Let's just call this a, a Samsung television set, right? I got six of them in the store. Well, we all know that that's inventory accuracy is always a challenge. So many retailers are implementing RFID to adjust that on hand to reflect what I actually have. So they do an RFID scan. By the way, RFID by default, by industry standards, is a serialized item. So I count all of those and I go, I really don't have six. I really have five. So I really have five on hand. However, as you look through these particular items, what you see is some of these items may be in the store, but they're not available for sale. So, so for example, I may have items that are in damaged locations. A customer has bought a television, didn't work for whatever reason, brought it back into the store, returned it. It's now back in the claims department. It's physically in inventory, but it's really not available for sale. I may have a different display. There's an example here with TVs on a display they may be showing a movie or whatever. They are in the inventory, but really not available for sale unless somebody wants a, a discount, et cetera. So you can kind of get down to, well, each one of those have a uh, have a UPC. I don't know how many I have available for sale. I have a unique serial number. I can tell you each one of the ones that are not available for sale, this one's in claims and this one's on the display, and this one's maybe moving around the customer's cart. I really only have one available for sale. So that's an example, Myron. I think you mentioned state and status, which is I can get down to that unique serial number and go, I'll tell you how many are actually available to go pick up versus how many I have in the store. Example is fair example. Yeah, I think you know, I think it's a great example. And and, and one we we probably collaborated on, you know, the, around what was just inventory states, right? right. Um, what what I have in the building. And and I think there's one that's even missing here as you look at where the digital economy is with you know, store shoppers and, and pick up today, um, you know, there's stuff that's in the inventory system and could be sitting on a shelf that an order picker will pick up and put in a basket. But until that basket gets picked up, that may be sitting in the store inventory, but not available on the shelf. You also have inventory that's in a customer's cart walking mm -hmm. around the store while she is shopping that is still in the store inventory but it's not available for sale. So if five people in the store have one in their cart, that's five units of on hand that are not available for sale, but are still in the inventory system. And so this inventory, inventory states concept starts to give you the, the, the impression of, hey, what are the different states of inventory that I actually have? And here you've got five or six different one on, ones on the screen between claims, display, store use, open box, somebody doesn't want to buy an open box if they want a brand new TV, uh, regardless because they think it may be missing something or may have an issue. And then what's on hand but not available because it's committed to a customer. And I actually see a day where you can reserve product by serial number for a customer who's willing to pay you in advance for that because there's limited quantity. Mm -hmm. You can go on and secure that for them and then block that at point of sale. Uh, we see that we've seen the same thing in bakery where we did we've done work where uh, I link the date code to a serial number so I won't allow anything that has a serial number date code linkage that is um, um, today so I won't I won't allow anything to be scanned that is expiring as of today so you can start to capture and quantify short dated or outdated product in advance as well so there's there's tremendous opportunities to build this inventory states model out not just across consumer electronics, but even consumer packaged goods and, and food products. 100%, 100%.
great, great examples. Um, so, so we're talking a lot about serialization, which is great. What gives me a unique serial number. Talk a little bit about, okay, but in addition to that, whether I use a data capture like RFID or 2D barcode, there's additional, additional attributes that you can assign to this serialized item that you can't assign to the UPC. Give us some examples of that, because I think that would be helpful for the audience as well. Well, it's, um, <clears throat> you know, with digital link, that's becoming somewhat of an infinite, and that's an EGS-1 standard of, of, of digital link. It's becoming a somewhat infinite capability using, you know, the internet and HTML code linkages. Um, what would be either integrated or connected database bases within a company. So I can start to manage receipt date. I can look at first in, first out. I can look at last in, first out. So date rotations. I can look at temperatures across travel and put floors or ceilings on that to say, did it ever break a temperature uh, zone? Uh, I'd mentioned G-Force earlier. Is this, ever, is this a sensitive product? Has it ever exceeded a G-Force aspect? Um, confirmation of sale and start warranty timers uh, around that. Um, the other thing is you, you start to now have a new data set in this uh, retail vendor partner relationship uh, that says, hey, what percent of volumes are leaving what stores at what time? And then how do you start to move uh, pricing investment money or promotional money into markets that it really moves the needle more. So I can start to look at ROI on these types of different investments and say, if I've got a store uh, marketing money and I'm distributing it across all stores on price, I may have stores that are actually out of stock and I don't know it because PI is so bad. So I just apply it universally versus putting more money into stores where maybe people are traveling further because they're in an electronics desert or a food desert and they really want, they really need the stipend and that will actually grow more sales. You know, I, I work with some startups where we, we test this. It's like, Hey, can I get people to go do an exercise for a buck? In, in some places in California where they're walking up down the beach, if there's a store there, sure. They'll walk in and do it for a buck, but they're not going to get in their car and drive, but they will for five bucks. Well, the same thing applies to product. Can I move, can I move short dated product? If the discount's deep enough, yes. So don't, some stores, 10%, 20% might move the needle because she's shopping anyway, or he's shopping anyway, and I'm going to make hamburger tonight. But if I have to get in my car and go, I won't go for 20%, but I'll go for 50. Mm -hmm. And so now you're able to start to make these thresholds and like know the quantity, know your actual spend, set a budget update for that, put it into finance, and then go quantify your sales versus markdown performance. And then all that, um, and this is the magical part. I think we, we just cut the, the long tail short. All that goes back into your forecast. Now your forecast gets smart because you're using real data as to price point, time, and action that drove sales. Then if you have any type of customer loyalty program or CRM where you're using you know, digital transaction information, you know what households will move at what price point. So now you know how to talk to your customers from a price relevancy perspective. And ser serialization enables all of that to the item level. Yep. Practical example, uh, grocery stores that bake bread, that product has a certain shelf life before you have to market <laughs> it and then you have to get rid of it. If if I, and, and by the way, I'm I'm stealing this one from Chris Brown from from uh, TSA. He just shared this dynamic pricing based upon the item status. If it's just made, it's full price. If it's three or four days old or whatever what the day is, it automatically dynamically for that item because we know what day it was made on can mark it down for twenty five percent off. So that ability to be able to leverage that unique serial number, it's not just UPC quantity price. It's a variable price based upon potentially the age of the product, right? right? Which goes back to your point of state and status, right? Yep. Um, the state of that bread is it's more than two hours old. And if we don't move it, we mark it. We mark it's a write-off, right? So it's better to move it at 50% than to throw it away. Um, yep. and, and I think that's a great example. I think it is a great example. And by the way, there's a lot of labor that goes into picking up each loaf of bread and looking at the date, which potentially goes away. I mean, maybe you just say, "Hey, if it's if it's if it's reached its day where we can sell it, we're going to automatically sell it for twenty five percent less. We don't have to go mark each one down as a CVP, or almost you just call it CVP, but a markdown process." So, 
Great example, yep. Chris. Great example. Um, another one that I think that is a pretty interesting example, and then we'll get into some of the hows. And, and from my standpoint, Mark, Myron, you and I have spent quite a bit of time, especially recently, kind of focusing in, against the what I'm going to call the loss prevention, asset protection kind of space. Um, I got an example here I'd love to get your reaction to because you're hearing about organized retail crime. You're hearing about the fact that shrink is at an all-time high. Nobody knows exactly where the shrink comes from. But today, I'll give you an example. And and Macy's, uh, Joe Cole at Macy's has been very public about this. Because it's all got unique serial numbers for every single item, and that's leveraging, frankly, RFID as the data character, they're able to uh, be able to look at what's sold at the register, obviously at the UPC level or G10 level, and take those UPCs and match them up against exits of items that are leaving, that's at the serialized level, and then in post, be able to say, here's what left the store that didn't get paid for it. But here's the problem. What we're doing is we're trying to compare what's sold at the UPC or G10 level to the serial number. And if if five left the store and five got paid for, we're in good shape. If none were paid for and five left the store, then they're all potentially a POS bypass. The challenge is if you sold two of them, but four of them left the store, which two didn't get paid for? We don't know. All we can do is match to a serial number. So how is actually serialization going? And by the way, some people are spending hardware to put RFID readers over point of sale. That has got some success, but it has some cost and obviously has some patience. How is a unique serial number this particular problem that we've got? Well, I think... um... When you're able to leverage a serial number at point of sale and hold on to that serial number, um, and and that's the the key point, I think, of this data discussion with serialization is you want to hold on to this number because then you can keep track of when that number moved, when that number was scanned. And with Sunrise 2027, that obviously gives you interoperability between an RFID serial number and a barcode printed serial number. So I can have a tag on a pair of jeans and read it through the supply chain all the way out to the sales floor. And then I can monitor through POS by scanning the serialized barcode when it was scanned out at the register. And I know which ones were scanned, style, size, color. So when you have grouped assortments or standard assortments that are just, you know, different sizes, different colors to uh, a generic EPC, it's really a blind operation all the way back to sales and forecast. When you have serialization, you can actually track that information and know what sizes are being stolen, uh, that walk out the door and get read, what sizes are being paid for, um, what styles are, that's happening to, is it a certain color that's happening to. So you can start to understand these different demand patterns and influence patterns. You can use that to reorder, but you can also use that to start looking at profiles within your store that could be based off of I'll use a simple example here that just just kind of tongue in cheek. If I've got Bentonville versus Rogers and I'm losing T-shirts, well, it's interesting because I'm I'm losing black T-shirts in Bentonville and blue T-shirts in Rogers. But when I look at the region, I'm just losing T-shirts because black and blue is in this assortment group. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's a differentiation because it's like, hey, there's a group that's that's taking black T-shirts because of the regional association to black T-shirts. And it could just be for fun, right? It could be a little – you know, high school, high school uh, trick uh, that they put that goes viral on TikTok that happens in the world today. But you're able to start understanding what's happening on a store by store basis. And then you, you can actually dig into further that further if you have different forms of computer vision in your store. So the interoperability between the serialization and other systems is tremendous. The ability to use the barcode when you need line of sight without putting new capital into your business. If you're changing out 20, 30, 40 front end registers to RF, that's a big expense. It's also really hard to control the RF field of view. So you get overreads and different things. Using the barcode, we know that works. We know how to do that. People are trained well on that. That works with scan and go. That works with uh, customer pickup orders. Uh, that works with a traditional cash register. So now I have a discrete point of sale view and I can link other choke points in the store 
uh, through that uh, with, with any RF reader capability. In some cases, I may use optical where I'm scanning cases going out to the back room. Some companies scan their cases as they pick them from the back room. Well, through the, <clears throat> the, the case, um, case uh, item hierarchy of GS1 standards, I can connect a case pack and know what serial numbers were put into that case from the manufacturer. So when I scan the case, I could know that those subordinate serial numbers are going to the sales floor. And then I know what I'm looking for at POS because of what's going to the sales floor. If I see something that goes through the register that hasn't moved to the sales floor, that could be a sign of an internal or organized theft situation where stuff is actually going out from the back room and not hitting the sales floor. So now I could know I need to look at employee profiles and things. And unfortunately that happened. So I think in this case, there's a lot to unpack and sit down and really kind of to kind of whiteboard these things. And um, it, it doesn't happen when you just bring in the technology. I bring in RFID or RFID tags. I bring in a serial number. You have to apply the data throughout your enterprise. And I, I love this conversation because this is some of the stuff that, that we've kind of talked and thought about over the years with folks is, hey, you, you can't take a serial number and convert it to a count and just keep PI the way you've had it for the last 40 years. You've got to hold on to the serial numbers. Some of those serial numbers you'll want to keep longer than others. If I'm doing it on a bag of chips or produce or, or bakery, I may only need that number in, in, in history for 90 days because the life cycle of that product and turns are so high. But if I'm doing TV electronics and higher warranty items, I might want to keep that for a year. So now my data storage starts to become a little dynamic based off of those profiles as well. Yep. 100%. And even with this example right here, I've got a situation where I'm matching a G10 to an SG10, and I'm going to get it wrong because there's kind of a one-to-many relationship. You talked about that 2D barcode, and, and I think in the future, we're going to look at something that looks much more like this, which is we're going to not put a UPC on the product. We're going to put a 2D barcode. And that's the unique serial number. That unique UPC and serial number combination is what's going to be scanned. And to your point, if they just throw away that serialized data, which they probably be very easy to do because all they want is a UPC to look up the price, they lose the opportunity to say what actually left the store versus what actually got sold at the serialized level. You throw away that, that opportunity. So you're 100% right. Here's the, here's the challenge. If I'm a retailer of a supplier, et cetera, my entire platform, my legacy system has been built on UPC quantity. This is the tough part, Myron. How in the world do you fundamentally change the legacy systems to incorporate this unique serial number? Number one, it's a whole lot more data. Number two, how, how, do, I, how do I think about transmitting that throughout the supply chain? Because we've always been UPC quantity based. How do you make that transition? Because that's not trivial. Well, I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Myron Burke. Join us next time as we continue the conversation right here.